Welcome to Spark's webcast, Expanding the Scope, Illustrating the Impact of OER Beyond Cost. I'm Monia Moya, Open Education Coordinator for Spark, and I'll be moderating this webcast. I'm so excited that y'all have joined this conversation, and during our time together today, we'll be exploring the many ways that open education can help educators help students. We're hosting this webcast to encourage the community to think beyond cost savings and affordability. While cost savings remains a really important tenet of open education, as the movement soldiers on and we face new challenges, it's increasingly important for our advocacy efforts to communicate and amplify the many other ways that open education benefits students. Taking that one step further, we want to emphasize the importance of the equity piece, where open education has the opportunity to transform teaching and learning by increasing representation and allowing for customization of materials, just to name a few examples. After the presentation, we'll have time for a Q&A from the audience, and presenters can also answer relevant questions throughout their presentation. So please feel free to submit questions in the chat box throughout the webcast. Today, you'll be hearing from three fantastic speakers, Haley Babb, student advocate from University of Lethbridge, Hilary Miller, scholarly Com communications librarian at Virginia U Commonwealth University, and Jasmine Roberts, higher education professional and lecturer at Ohio State University. We're going to discuss the roles of three key players in any campus OER movement, faculty, librarians, and students. Our speakers will lend their perspectives on the impact of each role on campus and how to create frameworks and goals according to each role's unique position. To start us off, we'll be hearing from Haley Babb, who can speak from a lived experience as a student OER advocate. As someone who was very recently a student myself, it's so exciting for me to get to empower students in this way by doing this work, and I know Haley feels the same way as I do. Whenever you're ready, Haley. Awesome. Uh, am I coming through okay? Yep, perfect. Uh, so hi everyone. Like Mo said, my name's Haley Babb and I'm uh, just finishing up my undergraduate at the University of Lethbridge right now. I'm majoring in psychology and I've been really involved in the student movement to promote open educational resources, particularly in Canada, but I've been doing a little bit of uh, work with Spark recently that's kind of given me a bit more of an international perspective, so I'm really thankful for that. Um, I got introduced to OER through my time as a uh, student advocate with my uh, students' union. So I started out as vice president academic and then went on to uh, become president of the organization. So um, I know that the student movement can look very different uh, depending on you know where you are in the world and what your institution looks like. But for me, that meant uh, a 40 hour work week um, in that role. Um, as well as trying to maintain a balance of being a student throughout that time. So when I got introduced to the idea of OER um, during my time as a student, it was very life changing for me because I, it was something that was really going to be helping me at that place that I was uh, in my studies. So I also kind of just wanted to preface by saying that obviously I don't represent all students in the world and, and that we're a very diverse group of people that all come from different backgrounds and lived experiences. But I think there are a lot of themes that run true throughout the student experience for most people. And so I did want to touch on each of those. But uh, first and foremost, I think we'd be kind of remiss if we didn't talk about cost a little bit. Um, and exactly what that means for students and why it is so important beyond just the initial sticker shock of when you pick up a textbook. Um, I think for a lot of people who are more immersed in the OER world, we understand why, um, why it is that uh, that small, well not small, but comparative to tuition, why this price um, tag associated with textbooks is so important to a student. Um, but for many people, I think it's um, something that's not quite universally understood why um, you know, students are already paying $10,000 per tuition. Why is it such a big deal if they're paying 500 on uh, textbooks? And my answer to that is, is simply predictability and uh, the structures that are in place to support students with their tuition, but not necessarily with books. So we're all, um, for the most part, very aware of uh, you know, what happens at the beginning of the semester when a student goes and picks up their textbooks and they're not exactly sure if they're actually going to be used in the classroom or not. But, you know, especially for new students who are already overwhelmed at the prospect of university, this is something that 
uh, can be really overwhelming. And so we want to do everything right. We want to, you know, go to the bookstore, just like we've been told uh, at, you know, new student orientation, but uh, we're not necessarily aware of all these other options that exist for us. So uh, I'm very lucky to have been exposed to this idea through my work in student advocacy, but for a lot of students, uh, they don't know that they have the power to ask for these resources. So that's something that through my work, uh, I kind of hope to empower and make sure, you know, students know that this option exists and that they're able to go ahead and ask for it. So beyond cost, um, there are a lot of things also that are really, really appealing for students about this. And I kind of wanted to start with pedagogy. Um, I know that we'll talk about this a little bit later um, with uh, Hillary and Jasmine, but from the student end, pedagogy to us simply can be translated to the fact that you can understand that your professor cares about you and, and wants to make sure that you're succeeding in your role. So it's very evident to a student uh, okay. who is sitting in five classes per semester, which one of those professors, you know, really, really care about their student success and which professors are, you know, maybe a little bit more concerned with uh, research and other aspects of their job. Um, and that's not necessarily uh, the fault of the professor. It could be, you know, on a variety of different causes, such as, uh, you know, just timing of research and stuff like that. But it's it's a student can really feel when um, a professor is taking time to make sure that their students are successful in the courses. And that is really powerful for breaking down some of these uh, power dynamics that exist between a professor and uh, their students and make students feel a lot more in control of their own learning. And it's these kinds of environments um, when students are put in them that really allow them to flourish and really allow them to be confident in their learning and take control of what's going on. A really great thing about OER um, at my institution, which is a little bit smaller and focuses on undergraduate research, is um, the ability for uh, not only graduate students, but also some undergraduates to be involved in their professor's research and then to be involved in publishing this work in open source. Um, as well as, you know, the ability to uh, hire students to be able to, um, for us, Canadianize materials that might be uh, being put out in the US or in other parts of the world that they can be adapted um, to the classroom that's being taught. And that's another very important part. I think um, students really value when they're represented in their material that they're learning. And OER presents uh, an immense, immense uh, amount of possibilities for uh, professors to be able to do that. Um, whether it's, you know, encouraging women in STEM or, you know, um, anything else that um, really resonates with the audience that's uh, being taught um, for people to be able to see themselves in the roles that they're going to school to study for is, is massive and students really, really appreciate that. Um, so I touched a little bit on kind of uh, pedagogy. I wanted to dive into accessibility next. And for a lot of students, um, accessibility can mean very, very different things. Um, with OER, you know, obviously we have the ability to be adding things to our textbooks like descriptive text on photos and closed captioning on videos and give students the ability to access these resources from uh, literally anywhere. Um, I'm actually currently uh, going to be off to a conference in a couple days uh, in Europe and I'm really excited because I have a little bit of coursework to finish up um, but my professors are using OER and so I don't need to be logging three giant textbooks on a plane and <laughs> using up my uh, space allowance for that so you know accessibility sometimes can come in forms that are not necessarily what we think off the top of our head um, at my campus uh, we also have uh, a lot of issues with um, infrastructure for accessibility um, and parking on campus. So a lot of students are parking blocks away um, and needing to walk in uh, to be on campus for the day and carrying those five textbooks is, you know, for the average person annoying, but for a lot of students that actually really does present a, a very physical barrier um, for how they can be accessing their learning. So by utilizing this technology that OER has, it's opening doors in ways that are more meaningful to certain students than you know a lot of us really think about on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, having the ability to have these resources available on the first day of class reading, uh, rather than waiting for um, a professor to order in a book that may not come four weeks in, especially if a student's in like a, a condensed semester or a summer semester where those four weeks are very critical 
Um, that's very, very imperative to student learning, um, as well as, uh, you know, making sure that um, the information that's needed is actually being presented in the textbooks and professors aren't needing to, you know, be choosing two or three um, to present the same amount of information. So um, the last thing I wanted to touch on, I suppose, would be sustainability um, of uh, open education resources and of learning in itself. Um, when I took my first uh, open education course, it really opened my eyes to, you know, not just learning in a classroom setting, but the ability for me to um, be at home on my own and be learning about things simply because I was interested in them and not because I needed them for um, a course requirement. And so this idea that knowledge can be disseminated um, in this way and doesn't need to just be for the purpose of attaining a credential um, has been really influential for me and has made me think a lot about, um, you know, the direction I want to be taking in my career and what I can be doing to support that outside of just uh, being in the classroom. So uh, I think for a lot of students, this is a really important piece of, uh, you know, taking control of their own learning and especially in today's day and age, really making sure that they're preparing themselves for those specific jobs that um, they really uh, want to be taking advantage of. Um, with a textbook, you know, a lot of students, I'm in that time in my uh, academic career where I'm looking at kind of mass selling all these big textbooks that I've accumulated so that I can put a down deposit on an apartment, um, you know, when I'm moving out of town for a job. And so uh, it's, it's nice to be able to have those textbooks to be able to resell them, but I'm not going to have that knowledge when I actually uh, get into the workforce and want to look back um, on that information. So OER is a great way to, uh, you know, make students feel like their learning doesn't have to end when they get uh, to the end of their program and when they leave the classroom. Um, the last thing I wanted to touch on as well was uh, licensing. Um, so. I've had a lot of professors who have been so kind as to, um, you know, post their slideshows on, uh, online and post uh, notes online. But sometimes um, where we can face a lot of uh, missing information is where, you know, fair dealing legislation in Canada and the US doesn't necessarily allow for um, some of those images and videos and excerpts to be accessed outside of the classroom. And so for a student who you know, maybe working a second job or, you know, maybe facing health issues or needs to be looking after a child and can't necessarily be in class every single day, um, trying to catch up from this information that's kind of half pieced together can be um, very challenging. And so um, with OER, we're able to kind of um, move past that and make sure that, you know, we're able to be presenting the complete inf information and make sure that students are getting exactly what they need. Um, and then the last thing uh, I kind of wanted to touch on was just the uh, the idea that, you know, OER is really green and for a lot of students uh, and um, majority of people who are looking at starting a career and starting, you know, maybe a, a life after um, university, this is something that they really care about and it's ways that we can be um, promoting learning while also ensuring that, you know, our planet is going to be um, looked after while we do so. So um, yeah, that's about uh, all I have to start off, but I'm happy to kind of um, take some questions from those talking points, or uh, maybe we'll do that after we move on to the next speaker. Thanks so much, Haley. That was uh, really, really good. And <laughs> I especially, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. I especially loved your thoughts on adaptive learning and how OER can make students feel seen in a way that maybe other materials might not. Um, so yeah, next up we have Hillary Miller, which I'm really excited about because she was actually the first person to ever tell me about OER. And she was my supervisor when I worked as a student library assistant helping out with BCU's Affordable Course Content Program while I was still in school. So needless to say, her passion was contagious. Um, whenever you're ready, Hillary, you can All right, can start. you guys hear me okay? Okay, great. Yeah, um, yeah so a little bit about me. So yeah, I'm, at, I'm at Virginia Commonwealth University, um, and I have been working on OER initiatives here since pretty shortly after I arrived. Um, 
maybe four years ago, and it was actually a newly created position when I got here, scholarly communications librarian. Um, but almost from the start, OER became one of the core parts of my position. So one of the things that I am working the most on, and we've actually been really lucky to recently hire um, another person, OER librarian, who's going to be working full time on this as well. Um, and over the last year, I have um, been a part of the Spark Open Education Leadership Program as well. Um, part of this program involves a capstone project uh, that we've been working on throughout the spring semester. And so after I cycled through many ideas uh, for, what, for what I wanted to do, um, I took part in an event earlier this semester that really helped me kind of define the project and kind of how I want to continue the work of the project even, even after the SPARK program. Um, and that sort of led me to, you know, being on this call today. Um, so I participated in this really incredible um, open textbook testing sprint um, earlier this semester at Virginia Tech for a business textbook with just an incredible group of faculty who I, I just am sure when they're in the classroom, like they are the kind of faculty their students know um, how much they care. I was really impressed by, by the work that they were putting into um, this test bank. Uh, and part of my role was actually just reviewing questions for sort of grammar and spelling and clarity and things like that. But I found it really interesting, um, not only learning a little bit about business in the process, but seeing how many questions were sort of mini case studies or situational questions. They were giving an example of a person doing a thing. Um, and I started wondering, just curious about where the names and the gender programs, uh, gender pronouns that people were using were coming from. Um, and I started, it was kind of difficult, actually, when people were like, I need a name, you know, to pull a name out of thin air for, for an example. And occasionally, we just sort of used each other's. Um, but what got really interesting was looking at how this could apply in a case, for example, for the chapter that was all about business ethics. So it was situations where people were either acting ethically or they weren't. Um, so it really, it sparked my curiosity in this. Like, I started, you know, examining a little bit who if you're pulling a name out of thin air, who would you name as a caterer, for example, for a business? Or who would be a CEO? Um, who would be um, like an entrepreneur who has this genius startup idea? Or in one example, who is the person making a bad ethical choice who's improperly using work resources? Um, so this all kind of led into this, this question that I'd also been struggling with for a little bit, um, for, for a while at my institution, because we had a lot of success actually on campus and even with administrators talking about affordability of textbooks and course materials as an issue. Um, we've had a lot of success actually getting sort of, you know, administrative interest from that angle. But what we haven't talked about as much is the potential that OER can offer for inclusion and diversity. Um, and so what I wanted to take on with this project was sort of my own struggle and I think, you know, in the library as well is how could I make inclusion and diversity a core part of what I'm doing with OER and even up to what the library's initiatives are. Um, so I've been talking to faculty both at my institution and looking for examples elsewhere of how faculty are working with OER specifically to make them more inclusive or diverse. Um, and also just to ask them what they, how they assess resources for these qualities in the first place. Like what is it that they're expecting for potential resources? Um, I know there are a couple of, you know, the, the OTN review criteria and the BC campus review criteria, for example, both ask faculty to address um, cultural relevance when they're reviewing open textbooks. But I really wanted to know what faculty are thinking when they are picking any textbook for a class, traditional or, or OER. And one trend that I've noticed with, a, you know, admittedly a very small sample size and it's very early, but there is this really contrasting set of expectations where traditional commercial materials you know are expected well they're probably not going to have anything too appalling you know it's not there's not going to be anything in here that's a really serious problem um, although examples of that absolutely do exist um, and you can find them pretty easily of textbooks that that have had offensive or or bigoted you know information in them but there's this, this contrasting expectation also that's just sort of accepted like the textbook is also really not going to meet everything that I want it to, especially from a diverse, you know, a, a, a perspective of diversity and inclusion. Um, 
I went to a teaching symposium actually just last week on my campus and I went to a session about decolonizing um, anthropology specifically, but it was sort of talking about ways that people can make their classes more inclusive um, and decolonize them. And I found it so interesting that it wasn't really focused particularly on the textbook. It was sort of the course as a whole and the syllabus and the teaching style. But the textbook got mentioned so many times just with absolutely, you know, standard reference. Like, and the textbook does not have this perspective. The textbook is totally missing um, this important person from history. Um, the textbook is just not um, not what we need. And I actually asked and found out they had ditched the textbook that they were using and are pulling together their own resources for it. So very excited for a potential OER outreach opportunity there. Um, so the question that I'm that I'm working on is how we can design OER from scratch when we're adapting something that's existing or creating new ER to make diversity and inclusion not an afterthought, but something that is designed and built in from the start. Um, some of the, the things that I want to talk about now are what role in particular that I can play as a librarian um, to share a little bit more about why this is important to me and sort of how I'm coming at this. OER wasn't actually a part of my job description when I started. Um, it was definitely on my radar and on my library's radar, but it wasn't something that I was specifically, my position was necessarily going to address when I started first. Um, and so the connection between a lot of the other work that I was doing with scholarly communications and with OER was the openness and open licenses. Uh, but not a lot of the rest of the work that, that I do is really related as much to teaching or pedagogy. So those things have been a huge learning curve for me. Um, but it's also provided an opportunity to partner inside the libraries with people that I haven't necessarily yet with, with OER. I've worked a lot with um, you know, liaison librarians to understand a specific discipline um, when I'm working with faculty. Um, but if I were to think of who I might want to tag or work with on a topic like inclusive teaching, there are a lot more options beyond me in the libraries and on campus. And these are people who I have not necessarily um, worked with or talked to about OER yet. Um, so one is our Division of Inclusive Excellence. Um, and I've actually um, reached out to someone there to meet up and talk a little bit more about diversity and inclusion in course materials. Um, what I'm really interested in, in learning is how they're encouraging faculty to approach things like diversity and inclusion in their courses. Um, and really importantly, I think for related to some of the work that, that I'm doing and some of the barriers that I think a lot of people hit is, how are they navigating academic freedom? How are they encouraging faculty to make a change that is gonna be a very positive change for their students, but that is not something you can necessarily require them to do? Um, another thing I'm looking at in, in libraries is how we have in the past and how we could in the future support or even prioritize projects that are specifically focusing on diversity and inclusion as a core part of why someone is choosing to adopt or create open resources. Um, and so I've been talking and looking at some of the projects that have come out of VCU um, for things about them that that I, I think I admired and thought were really great when they were proposing their projects, but they're not necessarily something that I've looked at through the same lens um, as I am now. Um, so for example, there's an intercultural communication textbook and the main reviewer is, surprise, a person who is not in the United States, um, which makes total sense. It seems very obvious. And on the other hand, knowing some of what I know about you know, problems that have been ongoing with existing you know, textbooks for decades is that that didn't necessarily have to be the case. Um, it could have absolutely been intercultural communication written from only the perspective of a single person in the United States. Um, some other really cool examples are gender, sexuality, and women's studies program. Our department is um, getting rid of the textbook that they've used for their introductory class, which actually is uh, pretty popular among the gen ed curriculums, uh, the gen ed curriculum. And they're putting together like a repository of resources that they are gonna have a greater focus on intersectionality. But another stated goal of their project is to put this resource together so that it can be made available and encouraged for use by courses throughout the entire university so that the kinds of content that they're teaching on in this class can exist in other classes um, 
And so um, let me check the time. Don't want to go over. Um, I think the most important thing that I want to wrap up before I pass this off is the most important thing that I that I think I can do and I'm working towards doing is making sure that I can lead with OER as a way to make courses and classrooms and our university more inclusive. Um, and I want to do this whenever possible. I want to lead with it whenever I can. Um, and in places where I can't do that, how can I make sure that I'm always speaking about it in the exact same breath when I lead with the cost savings? Because the cost savings, as many of you might experience as well, is something that really catches attention. It's a quick, shorthand way to get in the door. It's cost savings just kind of makes quick sense to people. Um, but what can I do to make sure, even when that's the message I'm coming in with, that I'm also bringing in this perspective of inclusivity? Um, and I think build a sense of confidence, too, in doing this self-efficacy so that I feel as prepared to talk about this as I do talking about cost savings. Um, I, I have this amazing spiel that's very targeted to VCU. It's got our student demographics. I've got the latest surveys on campus that are looking at food insecurity. And I can roll this amazing case up for cost savings on campus. Um, and I can talk open licenses all day. Like, I can run you know, trainings on the nuts and bolts of adopting and adapting and licensing resources. But where I don't have that same confidence and that same skill level yet that I have been working on, um, and that this program in particular has been helping me, helping me get, is this confidence in talking about um, inclusivity and diversity in OER. Um, so with that, I'll take questions or I think hand it off to Jasmine for the last part. That was really, really good, Hillary. Um, I always love hearing you talk about um, diversity and equity and inclusion, and that was a, a really great piece to add to our conversation, so thank you. Our last speaker today is Jasmine Roberts, an amazing and inspiring educator and advocate within our movement. At my first open ed conference last year, I was invited to speak on a panel with Jasmine about OER and inclusivity, which in many ways inspired me to center inclusivity and equity in my work with Spark. So whenever you're ready, Jasmine. Thanks so ahead. much, Mo. Can you guys hear me okay? Thanks so much, Mo. Can you guys hear me okay? Excellent. Yay! Yes. <laughs> All right, um, I'm really glad that Spark is hosting this webinar because these are questions I'm grappling with as I see more and more textbook publishers responding to how OER has become more mainstream over the last few years. Um, I believe it's been documented by a few research studies that the cost savings argument alone is not going to motivate faculty, or many, some faculty I'll say, to use OER, even though it is a compelling conversation to have, um, and it's a relevant conversation to have. So I'm always thinking, what's in it for the faculty? Because the commercial uh, publishers are. Uh, but aside from that, um, you know, because we don't always need to position ourselves against publishers, I think it's a good question to ask. So um, kind of my story and how I got into OER, um, and there's a bit of an echo a little bit, but that's okay. I think I can work through it. Um, I got into OER through a textbook grant program. And um, I, I think this is in 2015, I was just very frustrated with my current textbook. Um, I didn't feel like it, it really addressed some of the industry issues that are in communication more specifically, and um, I just didn't think it was a good use of my students' time um, or money to um, just assign nine chapters out of a 16-chapter textbook. So um, it was for professional reasons, but it was also for personal reasons. Um, you know, when I was in college, I was a first-generation student, so I understood firsthand um, just the cost challenges of trying to come up with um, the funds to buy your textbooks. Um, but more so from, an, I guess you can say, um, an experience standpoint, it was also frustrating to not see myself reflected um, in the textbooks. Um, meaning, whether that be my culture, my race, my gender, I just felt like um, the examples that were used were very much from the white male Western perspective. And I know Haley kind of touched on that earlier, and I'll touch on that a little bit later as well. 
And I, I talked about this recently at um, the OpenStax Creator Fest. So I, I vividly remember during one semester, I took a class, I think it was called um, American Investigative Journalism. And we were on one unit that discussed um, the history of American journalism. And so as a professor is lecturing and everything, I noticed, or I noticed that someone who I considered a heavyweight in the world of journalism was missing. And that person is Ida B. Wells. Um, she was an African-American female journalist born um, in the early or late 1860s. And Wells was well before her time. She was known for her anti-lynching campaign. She started her own newspaper, um, which she boldly exposed this American atrocity. And you know, I call it a terrorist act against um, black men and women. So, um, and it was just really, really disappointing for me as a student to not um, hear this professor talk about someone who was so influential um, in American history and in uh, the field of journalism. So I've kept that experience in mind while using OER in my own classroom. And as again, Haley said, making sure that my students are seen in some capacity and using culturally relevant examples. Um, I've also been thinking about another issue related to the impact of OER outside of the cost savings argument. That was a, oh, can you guys still hear me? I'm sorry, there's something that happened. Hello? Hello? Oh no. You're good. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Going on the mobile app here. Um, I forgot where I was at. Oh yes. Yeah. So there was um, an experience that, um, that um, a colleague of mine had. It was, I think it was late March. Um, I was being kind of nosy and listening on a meeting. I think it was late March. Um, I was being kind of nosy and listening on a meeting <laughs> that she had with um, a Macmillan um, sales rep. So they wined and dined her, gave her free lunch, you know. And as I'm listening, I noticed that they were showing her the latest gadgets and they kept saying how all of this would make her job easier and more convenient. And then it, it, it kind of dawned on me that many of the mainstream publishers are marketing convenience to faculty. They're not necessarily trying to make faculty members better educators. But I personally believe that OER are, you know. So OER, at least in my experience, has definitely made me a, a better educator. And I think it's because it, it forces faculty to ask a few important questions about the classroom experience. And I'll go through some of these questions and, and tell you guys how I've tried to grapple with some of the answers to them. So the first one being, um, how does the resource, whether it's an open resource or another material, how does it reflect my, my teaching philosophy? And if it doesn't, how can I make it reflect so that it, it, it can? Um, and I think that's what separates OER from you know, some of the other resources that you might see out there because of the open license that enables the permission piece. And I do feel like the permissions piece gets left out of the OER conversation, not intentionally, but again, just from a faculty perspective, when I was first exposed to OER, I automatically equate it to just digital resources. It was that permissions piece that I really didn't get a lot of, I guess you can say, education about until I actually immersed myself in the OER landscape. And so personally, my teaching philosophy is very student-centered, and um, my goal is to merge the gap between the classroom and the larger community. So I think definitely OER has helped me to reimagine not only what we could be doing as faculty members with a textbook or course materials more broadly, but also, um, and more importantly, what we should be doing with these type of resources. So I believe that we as an instructor should think of its utility outside of the classroom and how it can enable collaboration among instructors at various universities nationwide and even internationally. Um, so again, I, I kind of talked about how I initially approached my, my um, initial open textbook project as kind of like just a textbook replacement project. So I'm just going to write this textbook and that's it. But it's, there's so much more than that. And I, and I think that's because, um, or the, the initial reason why I thought that is because I think as, as faculty, um, sometimes our worldview can be a little small. Um, and what I mean by that is our view is kind of contained in the classrooms we teach. and. Um, you know, I think we can do a better job of taking the time to consider how our work can be useful to students and instructors at other universities and to the, the, the larger public. 
Um, so yeah, I, I definitely think um, for instructors, the, the beauty and magical, I guess you can say, part about OER is the permissions piece that enables collaboration. Um, and um, students, instructors, any user for that matter can keep, make copies, mix it with another resource, um, take chapters out. I mean, I just think that's a really neat part for faculty members to be aware of. And I guess you can see a piece of advice that I have for maybe not just librarians, but anyone who's, who's working with faculty. I think it would be extremely useful to show faculty examples of remix projects or remix textbooks to demonstrate the you know, permissions piece, the open permissions piece of OER, and to make the argument that OER are not just digital resources. So, and also when I wrote the initial textbook, the open textbook um, at Ohio State, um, it's, it's so crazy. I still put limitations on it, even when I found out about the permissions piece. So I was really surprised to find that instructors at Brown University, Clemson, and even in Canada were using the textbook that, that I created. So for example, um, I think it was Professor Kathan Ambrose from the British Columbia Institute of Technology has been using the textbook that I created. And I, I just think that that's very humbling for me, but I think it's very neat for her because she can take out those American examples that I included and put you know, more nationally and culturally relevant Canadian examples for her, her students. So I definitely would encourage faculty to imagine how a variety of audiences can use your materials, whether it be you know, someone in Chicago or Berlin or a retiree in, in California, just a variety of different audiences. And I think a, a second important question that OER forces faculty to ask, again, is what kind of examples should I use to make sure that my students are, are seen? Um, and, and I've always kind of had a, um, a very, um, how can I say this? I don't want to call myself culturally competent, but I've just been uh, aware of which cultures I'm centering in my teaching practices. But I think open education and OER have made me um, even more cautious in considering the importance of inclusive and culturally relevant teaching practices. Um, it, because that's just important for students as we become more, as the student body, I should say, becomes more diverse. And so I would definitely encourage faculty to think about whose voices you're centering um, as a result, and as a result, excuse me, whose voices are you placing on the margins. Um, so that, that requires a lot of reflecting your conscious and unconscious bias, right? <laughs> that might be reflected in a particular uh, resource. We're, we're, we're all guilty of it, to be honest with you. Um, I share this example sometimes when I'm speaking about OER. So this is before I um, came into OER as teaching a public speaking class. And so in, in public speaking, you're often um, taught um, the persuasive appeals, logos, ethos, and pathos, right? And that comes from ancient Greece, again, a very Western perspective of, of, of uh, public speaking. So I had a student, she um, from Nigeria originally, and she basically said to me, and that's all fine and dandy, but why are we not talking about the African griots who were <laughs> you know, great public speakers in their own right? And I just, I just froze because she, <laughs> she was so right. So uh, yeah, I definitely think that, that OER can challenge faculty to think uh, more about culturally relevant examples for our students. In terms of resources, um, I, in, uh, to encourage faculty to have more culturally relevant um, teaching strategies, um, honestly, I, I go to teaching tolerance. It is for K through 12 um, educators, but I have found some of the high school activities I can use in my classrooms, my college classrooms. And uh, again, teaching tolerance just provides resources for educators who want to address diversity um, and inclusion in their, their classroom. And then also I was listening to um, the Teaching in Higher Ed podcast recently, and one episode had Dr. Sylvia Kane from Vanguard University, I believe it was, and she was speaking about inclusive pedagogy. And she argues that um, inclusive teaching is, is important because we are teaching students, not content. And I just thought that was a really compelling point. Um, and again, encouraging faculty members to think more so about the students that we're teaching and not so much, you know, or as much on, on the content piece. And then the last question I think um, OER challenges instructors to, to um, uh, grapple with is, is what is our role in the classroom? Um, we're so used to talking at students and again, pushing through content. 
Um, but I, what I love about what OER has challenged me to do is not to just imagine my students as knowledge buckets where they're just soaking in all this information and they're not you know, really immersed in that learning process. They're not also creators and, and contributors to that learning process. And um, OER has definitely um, made me more appreciative of the fact that students can be contributors to, to knowledge and to content. Um, and we should really try to move away from those lecture heavy uh, classes. So when I was finished creating the um, open textbook, I actually uh, switched my classroom approach to what I call at least a, a soft flip classroom in which um, I might recap the reading for about five to 10 minutes. And then the rest of the class time is devoted to some type of in-class activity. So it's a lot more hands-on. I teach a lot of writing classes. So if my students don't have opportunities to actually write in the classroom, informal opportunities, not just graded opportunities, um, I feel like that's really putting them at a disadvantage if they don't have those, those opportunities. And then not only that, I've actually offered extra credit opportunities for students who can come up with really compelling and relevant examples for some of the class concepts um, that I talk about. And um, if they choose to openly license their work, it can be included in the textbook. So again, that's just a very small example of how instructors can um, you know, really include students in that learning process as contributors. And it gives the students a, a lot of sense of, of agency with their education, and, and they tend to be more engaged with the material when they feel as though they're really contributing to, to that knowledge. So that's about all that I have. Like I said, you know, my, my key takeaway point is that OER has made me a better educator. I think that's what separates OER apart from some of these other resources that might be available to, to faculty members. And I will pass it over to Mo. <laughs> All right, thank you, Jasmine. That was really good. Um, I am thrilled that we were able to have this conversation and that it was so fruitful and that it seems that our participants, um, from what I'm seeing in the chat, um, have gotten some great stuff out of it. So we also have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, let's see. Okay. Does anyone know of any OER textbooks written by POC women LGBTQ plus? Hmm. A really good question. Looks like. Does this person mean like authored by OER? I'm sorry, authored by POC or Clear? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, aside from me, no. It's <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> a really good question. Gosh, oh, let's see. This is Hillary jumping in. I, I don't know that that question has been answered or explored much. Um, I think it would be interesting just to kind of, you know, as a benchmark and kind of understanding what the impact of, of OER really is having is, for example, are there more people of color or queer people or women mm. who are authoring resources than, you know, the traditional um, textbooks that have existed out there for a long time, but I don't know that 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 question has been has been answered or explored. Yeah, this is Jasmine again. Um, I, I know at my respective university at Ohio State, they, the, the newest grant recipients, recipients, excuse me, um, I know a lot of folks in that cohort are um, at least more than usual, people of color and, and um, those from the LGBT community. Um, yeah, I think of these 16 recipients, there are um, six people of color faculty members that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, and, and those textbooks will be coming out, um, I believe, uh, I want to say late August, early September. 
but in terms of more broadly um, the OER landscape, that I, I don't know the answer to, but I think it's a very compelling question. Um, it's a great research question. <laughs> so thanks for asking that. All right, um, got a couple more questions. What was the OER course that you took, Kaylee? Awesome. Uh, thanks for the question. So I've taken a couple courses that have used OER in, in different ways, and I think that's uh, kind of the beauty of OER. Um, it can be really, you know, obviously tailored to, to what that professor needs. Um, the one in particular I'm talking about, I'm actually uh, taking a couple supplemental courses through Athabasca University. And so my professor is uh, using resources uh, that have been um, publicly available online and just has kind of compiled them into a um, sort of like a course manual uh, rather than um, an actual textbook. So that way um, my professor is, uh, you know, utilizing uh, papers and um, different essays and resources and stuff that have been published under that open license and, and compiled, compiled them into one uh, sort of document that um, is able to uh, be utilized by all of us. So I've also have had professors who have done this um, in a paper format. So they'll so they'll compile all this material, and a lot of the time, um, that will include uh, research that's been done by that professor. But that's actually fantastic because um, you know they're obviously experts in, in that field, and and it's fantastic to be learning from them. Um, but then they'll make it publicly or not publicly. Sorry, um, they'll make it available at our bookstore for a fraction of the cost of what it would um, be to to buy a textbook that includes all that licensing stuff. So I've had one uh, semester where I've only had to pay like maybe $50 in my course material um, books because uh, my professors have made that available through like a, a $20 um, booklet as opposed to a $100 textbook. And the material is more tailored for exactly what it is that we're learning. So I've had a variety of different experiences um, with this. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, it's, it's been great to, to have the opportunity to go through that unique learning, and I hope that answers your question. Yeah, great. Um, we have a question about STEM disciplines, World Cup questions. Are STEM disciplines more resistant to adopting OER, and can you discuss the incentives for STEM faculty to adopt OER when there are more benefits for them to focus on getting grants? And um, yeah, I guess that, that's open to anyone. It's really, Mrs. Jasmine, again, it's really interesting because I've, I've actually seen a lot, a great deal of open textbooks or OER more, more broadly from the STEM field. However, I think um, culturally, and again, this is, these, are not, um, these are not my disciplines, so I, I can't really speak to it too, too much. Um, I have heard anecdotally from some of my STEM colleagues that there is a bit of a huge resistance at first um, and maybe even just throughout the process of, of using OER. Um, and, and I think it has largely to do, to do excuse me, with the reward system um, at universities and colleges, um, at least in the United States. Um, and I think that, or at least I've heard that's particularly the case in, in the STEM field. Um, but like I said, it's you have that piece, but you also have the fact that there are a lot of open textbooks coming out of the STEM field. Um, so it's it's interesting how the two kind of contradict one another a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, got another question for Haley. Can you talk about your student advocacy work and how you communicate this info to students? Yeah, so I suppose like my first initiative that um, really got me involved in OER was actually a collaborative um, effort that was put forward by myself as well as um, four other students who had the same position as me at different universities within Alberta. So. Um, I think a lot of people may be aware of the textbook broke BC campaign that happened uh, throughout British Columbia where a lot of students um, 
tried to create awareness about the fact that a OERs exist and B uh, students have the ability to ask for them. So we um, did this. We would uh, we actually set up outside of our university bookstore um, and talk to students about what they were spending on their textbooks um, and you know help them to understand that there is an alternative and they can be asking for these things. So. Um, a really great initiative that uh, I unfortunately wasn't able to carry out on my campus, but I would have really liked to had I had more time. Um, I believe it was uh, McEwen University. They ran a really fantastic campaign where they um, encouraged students to talk about the affordability of their course materials in their course evaluation. Um, and this was a great way to kind of nudge faculty in the right direction to say, um, you know, this is something you can be thinking about and this is something that you can adopt in your classroom. and. I think a lot of times students don't necessarily realize um, the impact that they have when they uh, go out and ask for these things. It's one thing for a faculty member to be talked um, to from a top down approach from an administrator or a dean or something like that about um, how you can be adapting uh, teaching styles, but for it to come also um, from the student perspective, I think that can be a really powerful thing. And so for our student associations and student leadership groups, it was really important that we gave that information to students, that we were sharing information on our, you know, like student union website um, and helping to talk about these resources in a way that was easy for students to understand. Um, because I think a lot of students who come to university are still learning about, you know, what is research? How do I conduct research? What does it mean to publish? conduct research, what does it mean to publish an academic paper? So trying to promote that awareness as well as, um, you know, teaching students the ropes of what academic publishing really looks like. And then so on top of that institutional work, um, I also did a little bit of work with um, our provincial lobby group. So for all of Alberta and then as well as our Canadian uh, lobby group. So I was part of the Council of Alberta University Students and the um, Canadian Alliance of Student Associations. So we would regularly um, collect data from, you know, our student bodies about uh, textbook usage and how much students were spending. And then we'd bring that forward to legislators and policymakers, um, both at, uh, you know, the provincial and federal level. And we've had some fantastic uh, advocacy wins there for funding for OER and as well as just general awareness. Um, I think many of us know that, you know, the, the impact of open research extends far beyond just, uh, you know, the realm of post-secondary and, and really has a big impact on public policy and government. So it was really important for us to bring that information to them as well. Can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so I have one more question. If um, if the audience doesn't have any more questions, I'll end on this note. What does the future of OER look like from your point of view? And this is open. I would love if all three of you answered, but you know, feel, feel free to jump in if you have any thoughts. This is Hillary. I'll jump in. Um, this is maybe not a, a fully formed thought, but I guess my, the first word that I thought of when you asked this question is that this is sort of, I'm hopeful that this is sort of a reset or like a, like a reframing, like we're re, re-centering resource course materials on where they should be. Um, it is my hope for OER. You know, I think that as Jasmine noted, like there's, you know, some, tough competition out there with this idea that publishers may be able to provide something that's just very convenient. But my hope is that this is an opportunity for us to really reset and re, um, recenter the conversation around student success, around inclusivity, um, and that going forward, um, 
those will become more of a norm, like OER will become more of a norm when people approach their course materials. So. Um, this is uh, Jasmine. Um, in terms of the future of OER, I I'm hoping that it can assist in the conversations we're having about higher, <clears throat> excuse me, higher education more broadly. I think we are coming to, we're entering a time where we're really reckoning with higher education and the, and the role that it serves in, in um, a variety of communities. And um, I think there are a lot of critical questions asked um, about the utility of, of college and universities and um, the um, impact of a faculty member's work um, more broadly on the public and, and not just, you know, teaching in our little silos or publishing in our little silos. So I, I um, at least that's my hope that OER can help us to really um, criti critically examine um, the systems within higher education. Awesome. Uh, I'll jump in one more time as well. Uh, I think just to, to leave off on uh, a note uh, from the student side of things, um, I just wanted to thank uh, all the educators who are in here today and just say that, um, you know, your willingness to, to be involved in these conversations and to be interested in, you know, what it is that students have to say and be conscious of what it means to um, foster learning, well, obviously learning, but, you know, um, a, a specialized approach to learning um, really means a lot and, and your students will definitely be picking that up from you. And I think that the, the educators that really need to hear this message most are not the ones who are in this chat. Um, so true. And <laughs> there's many ways that we can go about. <laughs> yeah, for sure. There's many ways that we can go about engaging them, but I think a really valuable resource that you have is your students. And so you already have the advantage of having that relationship built up with your students um, by simply being someone who cares about, you know, how they're how they're succeeding in their in their studies. So um, talk to them about open education resources and how they can get involved in advocating for them. Um, they'll carry that on into future lectures and into future classes with future professors and um, I don't want to say do the work for you, but uh, you know, they'll be able to carry on that message in a, in a different way than you will speaking to another um, professor or colleague to colleague. So just, uh, I, yeah, I'm not sure where I'm really going with this, but I just wanted to say thank you for, for doing what you do and uh, let's hope that we can keep the conversation going. Awesome. Thank you for um, that, that last note. It was really nice. I think it's important that we thank each other because this is really hard work and it's care work and um, we, we need to support each other in that way too. Um, so that's it for the webcast. Um, finally, we'll ask you that you keep this window open as we end and you'll be automatically redirected to a very brief survey about today's webcast. Your feedback is really helpful in improving our programming and identifying topics we should cover on future webcasts. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining and to the speakers for helping make this what it was. And I hope you all, all have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone.